In just a moment, your radio theater. But first, three programs keep you laughing tomorrow night on NBC. One is You Bet Your Life with Groucho Marx. A 30-minute question and answer session with lots of spontaneous fun when Groucho and contestants get together. The second is Truth or Consequences, the only quiz show where contestants never tell the truth because it's much more fun to pay the consequences. And the third is an old friend brought to you every Monday through Friday, Fibber McGee and Molly, guaranteed to keep you chuckling from start to finish. Hear them all tomorrow night. And now stay tuned for your radio theater on NBC. The distinguished motion picture star, Mr. Herbert Marshall. Good evening from Hollywood. This is Herbert Marshall in the wings of your radio theater. And tonight we are privileged to bring you our presentation of one of the most famous films produced in Hollywood in all time. And to head the cast, our star, recreating his original role, Victor McLaglen as the informer. Victor's famous Gippo role on the motion picture screen brought him an Academy Award Oscar for the best performance by an actor. And now, act one of the informer, starring Victor McLaglen. At Easter time in 1916, rebellion flared in the streets of Dublin. The Irish Republican Army was defeated, but its men continued in underground warfare with the British military, the hated Black and Tans. Out of this time came men of courage and greed and cowardice. It was a time to remember the name of Judas and the verse which reads, Then Judas repented himself and cast down the 30 pieces of silver and departed. This isn't a long story. I can tell it to you in only a few minutes. I know it better than anyone else. I was part of it. The whole thing took less than 12 hours. 12 hours, but it was as long as a man's life. Did you hear it? It started already, started ticking off the minutes of a man's life. It began at five o'clock of a fog-swelling evening in strife-torn Dublin. That was in 22, when we were fighting for freedom and independence. The Tans patrolled the streets, marching up and down with guns on their shoulders and grenades in their belts. And there were posters on the walls of every building. Twenty pounds reward? Wanted for murder? Frankie McPhillip? Ah! It was Gippo Nolan, tall, the poster from the wall. Gippo Nolan, tall as two men, broad as four, and strong as a dozen. Frankie McPhillip was Gippo's pal, you see. His best pal. His only one. Of course, there was Katie. Why, she loved him, none of us ever knew. She was kind, Katie was, and put in a tired sort of way, and poor as a tinker's mule. On this night I'm telling you of, with the fog swirling in north the Irish Sea, she was standing on the corner waiting to meet the rich cattle dealer, Michael McCarthy. Good evening to you, Katie. Oh, oh you took the breath out of me coming up so sudden like that, Mr. McCarthy. Well, are you ready for dinner, Katie, me girl? And where would you like to eat? Well, I... No, now, don't be after troubling your head about the cost... How about the Red Bank? I I don't know, Mr. McCarthy. You will be having dinner with me, Katie. She will not. Oh, Jippo. Oh, tis yourself again, is it, Nolan? I warned you before now. Stay away from my Katie. Don't you be after making threats to me, Jippo Nolan. I'll see her if I want her. Oh, you will, will you? Well, he's me answer to that. Oh, 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 Jippo, you shouldn't have done that. Ah, come on now. Oh, Jippo. Jippo, what's the use? He was only going to take me to dinner. And I'm hungry. Have you the price of a meal on you? Katie, where would I be getting money? Where now? Oh, Chippo, Chippo, please don't look at me like that. You're all I've got. You're the only one. You know that. But I'm tired of being cold and hungry. Sure, what chance have we to escape? I, I, I don't know, Katie. There, 
There's nothing I can do. We're, we're stopping. What are you stopping for? What are you stopping in front of a shop? What are you looking at? You see the sign, Jippo. Ten pounds to America. Information within. <laughs> Money. Some people have all the luck. Look at that thing, handing us the ha-ha. Ten pounds to America. Twenty pounds and the world is ours. Ah, what are you saying that for? Saying what? Twenty pounds. What are you driving at? Oh, Jippo, what's the matter with you? Twenty pounds. It might as well be a million. Go on, go on, go on. Get your twenty pounds from that scot I threw in the gutter. Well, Saint Jippo, too good for me, are you? Well, let me tell you something. You're no better than any other man. You're all alike. Oh, Katie, I, I didn't mean that now. Go along, you and your fine principles. I can't afford them. Katie, Katie, wait! But she didn't wait. It was angry she was, and her heels kicked away from him. And she left him standing there before the travel agency window. Twenty pounds to America. Twenty pounds, and the world is ours. <laughs> At 5.30, Jippo Nolan was sitting alone at a bench in Dunboy House, eating a poor meal of potatoes and buttermilk. Staring down on him from a wall in Dunboy House was a reward poster. And then suddenly, staring right at him, face to face, was Frankie McPhillip himself. Hello, Jippo. Frankie! Well, don't you know me, Jippo? <laughs> I don't wonder that you stare. I'm lucky to be finding you here. Hey. Man, man, what is it? What are you staring at? But you, but you came up to me so sudden like. Oh. Maybe I'm getting jumpy finding out there's a price on me head. Twenty pounds. Ha! Huh? So that's all I'm worth. Oh, Jippo, six months is a long time, me boy, to be on the run. Sleeping out in the hills, freezing to death, no decent grub. So I says to myself... I'll sneak into town and see me mother and I'll duck right out again. Here I am. Jippo, did... Did you deliver my messages? I did. I did. And what did my mother say? Ah, uh, she blessed the saints she were alive. She followed me out and gave me half a quid to give to you. Uh, but I was so hungry myself, I, I spent it. Oh, <laughs> you big lover. That was her way of giving it to you. She likes you, Jippo. The Lord knows why. For murder. Twenty pounds reward, Frankie McPhillip. Jippo. Jippo, what's come over you? What are you gawking at? Is there something queer about me? No, Frankie, no, no. I, I... It's just that I'm in bad trouble. You see, I've been court-martialed. Man. What you, for? Uh, you remember that the baton that killed McHenry and Cannon? I do. Well, we drew lots for it. And I got the short match. Well, I took him out in a lorry and he begged for his life. Aye. I couldn't do it, Frankie. Not in cold blood. No. Uh, besides, he swore he'd he desert if I let him go. And you believed in Jippo. What did Commandant Gallagher say? Oh, he near had me plugged when I went back to report. And then they threw me out of the organization. And now... The British think I'm with the Irish, and the Irish think I'm with the British. And the long and the short of it is that I'm walking around starving without a dog to lick me trousers. Oh, you poor fathead. G Jippo, it's your help I need now. I looked you up first to find out if the Tans are still watching my mother's house. Is there a guard on the house? Not since Christmas. Huh? Well, then I'm off. And if I get a chance to see Gallagher, I'll put a word in for you. Up with the rebels, Jippo. Up with the rebels. Frankie, my Philip, 20 pounds. Ah! All the same, it's 20 pounds. <laughs> Jippo Nolan sat there, poor man, sat there alone, 
and pondered the half-thoughts that rose to his befuddled brain. British headquarters in Dublin at the time were housed in a dark grey building with a high iron fence all around. No self-respecting Irishman would be caught within two blocks of the place. At five minutes after six by their own clock, Jippo Nolan, perspiring with nervousness and wiping his big, dumb face with his cap, stood before the desk in the town's headquarters, watching the Major, busy with his writing. Yes? Well, I... It was well, like... speak up. What do you want to say? Well, I... I... It was like this, I, I... I've come to claim the 20 pounds for Frankie McPhillip. A quarter past six, Mary McPhillip, and the bread's not cut yet. Oh, it's that fresh. I can't cut it, Mother. Look at the crumbs it makes. Mary, is that the front door? Hello. <gasps> Oh, boy, boy. Oh, mother, mother. Mary. Oh, Frankie. Oh, praise be to God you've come back to us. Now save your praises for this fog that's upon us, mother. It's the best friend I've had this night, what with dodging down dark streets to get here. Oh, I was so homesick to see you. Mm. I walk right down the middle of O'Connell Street just to get a glimpse of the both of you. Oh, musha, my son. <laughs> sure, you must be starving. Take his coat from him, Mary. Hang it up. Oh, Frankie, you shouldn't have come home. Oh. It's not safe. Oh, what a long face for a sister. I'm in with the fog and I'm out with the fog and nobody will be the wiser. You sure nobody's seen you? Oh, just me old pal, Jeff Nolan. You see, I, I had to find out if the Tans had a guard in the house. <sighs> Now, sit down at the table, Frankie. Have a nice cup of tea. You can do all your talking afterwards. Soldiers, they're breaking in the door. Machine gun, machine gun. Get them over there. They're outside, dozens of them. It's the tan. Give oh, me a Where's my coat? No, no, put that gun back, Frankie. Mary, Mary, let me go. Frankie, don't give yourself up. When I can escape. Why should I hurt you? Stay up back, Mary. Get away. I can get away now. Frankie, don't. Get out of the way and let me shoot! After him! He's going out the window! Thank you! Stop! He's out of the window, hanging on the sill by his hands. Blow there, machine guns! killed trying to escape, sir. Frankie. Frankie was killed. Oh. Give him his money. Twenty pounds. You better count it. Show him out the back way. All right, sir. Come on, Nolan. At 7.30... Chippo found himself in the rear of the Tan's headquarters, seeing the fog and the rain through the barbed wire. He glanced about, he did, and then slipped the money into his pocket. As he walked out onto the street, a man seemed to be waiting for him. Why, you... What are you spying on me for? But seeing as how the man was blind, Chippo took his hands off his throat and let him tap away down the street. The blind man had frightened Jippo, though, and the sight of a reward poster for Frank McPhillip had shaken him. So he cut his way through the fog to a public house. Give me your whiskey. <laughs> There's a lot of things I'd like if I could afford it. What is it, money you want? Here. Well, help yourself. Ah. I'll take the bottle to the table with me. Suit yourself. I've got to have a plan. I've got to have a plan. Oh, Jim Hall. Uh, who's that? I'm your brain. You can't think without me, Jim Hall. You're lying. 
lost. Yeah. You're lost. I'll, I'll make it my own way. Chippo. I, what? Uh, sit down, Chippo. I, Katie, what do you want to be sneaking up behind me like that for? Oh, I've been looking all over for you. Oh, I'm sorry that I blew up on you like that. Up in the street, I mean. Oh, Jippo, Jippo, you know that I love you. You're the only one. You know that. Only sometimes I, I get so crazy that I, I don't know what I'm doing. I, I got it now. Uh, yeah, I, I did it for you. You did what? At the bartender. You forgot your change, me boyo. Did you get that money? Well, look at it. And not an hour ago, you hadn't a penny to warm your pockets. Did somebody die and leave you a pot of gold? What are you saying that for? Oh, did you rob a church or what? I got it now. You, you mean that you, you robbed a church? Oh no, no, it wasn't a church. It was a, it was, it was a sailor off an American ship. Shh, not so loud. I, I went through him at the back of Cassidy's pub on Durham Street. He was drunk. And, but if you say a word of it, you'll get me into trouble. Oh, me? And what do you take me for? An informer? Uh, what are you talking like that for? What? Jippo! Who's an informer? Jippo! Don't be saying things like that. I, I, I didn't mean any harm. Now, come on, Jippo. Let's get out of here. Huh? Oh, one more now. Uh, come on up to my room. There's a nice warm fire there. Here. Here's your money, Jippo. Now, now, come on. I'm taking this with me. Oh, darling, you don't want any more of that. The butter goes with me. Oh, well, all right, then. But come on. Wait, no. Wait. Ah, there's a drop more drink in the bottle. Oh, no, Jippo. Ah. Ah. There, now. Katie. What is it? It's, oh, it's just a blind man, Jippo. Where's me money? Hey, hey, you wait there, wait. Here, this is for you, understand? Hey, thank you, sir. Oh, Jippo, you, you gave him a pound note. I know, Katie, I, I... Jippo, why are you looking like that for? Where are you going? Ah, I forgot something. They'll be wondering why I'm not there already. <laughs> By 8.30 in the evening, the McPhillip house was filled with mourners. Two nuns and a priest stood by the coffee on this side of the candles, praying for the soul of Frankie McPhillip. His mother was a sorrowful sight. Her sitting in a rock, a going up and back and tears coursing down her face like rainwater into the liffy. The only words she said were to call out for her son. The rest of us sat quietly. We talked in low tones, as is befitting it awake, of course. There was only one word on the tongues of us that did speak. It is easy seen to the work of an informer. To sure, it is the work of an informer. And it was there, in the MacPhillip home, that I, Bartley Mulholland, first saw him after it happened. He came a-staggering up the steps, pulled off his cap, and crept into the room. Bartley? Hmm? Jippo and Holden. I see. Sitting down on the floor near Frankie's mother. I'm... Uh... I'm, I'm sorry for your trouble, Mrs. McPhillip. What are you shouting for? Don't you know there's a wake going on? Ah, let him alone, Bartley. Sure he was a friend of me, dead boy. All the same, you should show more respect for the dead. Now, get up from there, Jippo. Ah, yes. Yeah. Ah. Well, now, will you look at that money? Leave him alone. Sure. I was only going to give your money back to you, Mr. Nolan. I can pick up my own kind. There. Well, what are you staring at? I, I swear that all that's holy, I want him to keep away from this house. Well, good heavens, Mancho, there's no one suspects you. Sure, that's right, Jippo. No one suspects you. Oh, Frankie, Miss son. Oh, you've been very good to me, Mrs. McPhillip, and I'm sorry for your trouble. Is there something to help you with? He's going out. Follow him, Tommy. Chippo! 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 Oh, 
Skippo. Man alive, what are you hurrying for? Who's in a hurry? What makes you think I'm in a hurry? Oh, no, d- don't be getting your rag out, me boy. Oh, this is a free country and a man can ask questions without, without all this gossiping, especially from an old pal. Tell me now, are you working now? No! What? Don't be shouting at me like an aboriginal, will you? You can't blame Bartley and me for taking a friendly interest in you for old time's sake, seeing as how you were one of us at one time. Why, you, I... Look, Chippo, do! Chippo! Bartley! Tommy! Tommy, Chippo! Here, here, now, none of that. Now, let go of him. Now, what's wrong, boys? What are you up to? Uh, He suspects me. He suspects you of what? Oh, I didn't say anything, Bartley. I only asked him to see you. You're a liar, you did. Both of you. And well, I know you, Bartley Mulholland and Tommy Connor. You're Commandant Gallagher's right hand men, and I. Shut up, Chippo, you mad. Well, you have people listening. Well, don't be accusing me, then. Come on, let's get out of here. No! Commandant Gallagher wants to see you, Jippo. Well, I'm not going. Come on, man. He's not going to eat you. Is it afraid of the Commandant Yard, Jippo? Afraid? I'm not afraid of the finest man that was ever worked. Well, then, come on, then, man. Now, let's get out of here. Keep your hands off me. Come on. I'm ready to see Gallagher. <laughs> In just a moment, Herbert Marshall will be back to bring you Act Two of The Informer, starring Victor McLaughlin. Your radio theater will be back after a brief pause for station identification. And now, ladies and gentlemen, here again is our host, Mr. Herbert Marshall, and your radio theater. And back we go to 1922, and the damp streets and alleys of Dublin, as we present Victor McLaughlin and Act Two of The Informer. It was running short for all of us. Headquarters of the Irish Revolutionary Organization were in an old warehouse. And it was there that the leader of our organization, Don Gallagher, a fine man, stood and watched the fire in the grate lick at the edges of a MacPhilip Award poster and finally consume it. He was engaged to marry Frankie MacPhilip's sister. And he was thinking heaven knows what thoughts when Connor and I passed through the guards and saluted him. Well, Captain Mulholland, sir, with uh, Jippo Nolan. Well, Jippo, you don't seem glad to see me. You've got a grudge against me. Why? Ah, there isn't a thing I wouldn't do for you, Dan. Yeah, I... Yeah, but you had me caught martialed and expelled from the organization. You disobeyed orders and endangered the organization. You had a fair trial, Jippo. Only for me, you wouldn't have got away as easy as you did. But forget all that. We've got something on hand now that is as much your business as ours. Frankie McPhillip was your pal, wasn't he? Well, sure, sure. I want your help, Chippo, that's all. Now, this looks like the job of an informer. And we have to get that informer, you understand? All I can say is that if you don't help us with this job, people might think... It isn't that. It isn't that. Look here, Commandant. It, 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 it's how I... It's how I, I... I don't know what I'm doing. What's the matter, Chippo? What's the matter? For the last six months, I've been starving. What's the matter? I've been living from hand to mouth on whatever I could borrow from sailors and dockers. I got no clothes, I got no money, I got nothing. My pockets are empty. I just got nothing. Look here, Jippo. I'm going to make a fair deal with you. Last October, you put us all in a very dangerous position. We'll call that quits and reinstate you on one condition that you find the man that informed on Frankie McPhillip. You mean that? Indeed I do, Jippo. Put it there, Dan, me boy, put it there. <laughs> well, what did I tell you? What did I tell you, Bartley? There isn't anything I wouldn't do for you, Dan. There isn't anything I wouldn't do for you. Now, can we have a drink on that? Here. Aye. Let's have a drink on that. Have a drink on the commandment, Tommy, Bartley. And, boy, now here's a drink for you. Who informed on Frankie McPhillip? 
Uh, I'll tell you. I'll tell you now. Uh, uh, it, it was that rat Mulligan. Mulligan? Mulligan the tailor? Sure. As sure as you're born. How do you make that out? I'll tell you, Commandant. It, 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 was, it, it was the grudge. What grudge? Why the grudge? That grudge. Mulligan had on Frankie. About what? Oh, it's a long, long story. Long, long story. Uh, uh, there's another little drink in the bottle. Take it. Man uh, alive. You've eradicated the whole bottle. Come on now, Jibbo, out with it. What grudge are you talking about? Well, uh, you, you remember his sister Susie? Whose sister? Why, Morrigan's. What has she got to do with it? What has she got to do with it? Oh, why shouldn't she have something to do with it? Why is she in trouble? Wasn't Frankie the boy that was named? I never heard that. Nor I. Well, well, now it's true anyway. Well, here, figure it out. Figure it out for yourself now. That's why Mulligan informed. I saw him going into the town's headquarters tonight. What time? What time? What time now? Up at six. Well, are you taking me back, Dan? If your statement checks up, you'll get back. There'll be a court of inquiry tonight at half past one at the ammunition dump. Bartley, you take him up. Arrange to meet him somewhere. All right, Bartley, me boy. <laughs> You'll find me down at Tatey Mad. Right. I'll see you boys later, Bartley. Bartley, me boy. <laughs> it's him, Dan. I'll stake my life on it. He's the one that did it. I drunk. Drunk? It's a wonder he can walk at all. Keep at Chippo's heels like a potted loo. Find out all you can. And bring him to the ammunition dump at half past one sharp. Right. I did as I was told. At ten o'clock, Jippo Nolan was in a public house in Abbey Street. It was closing time, but the crowd was still clamoring for the drinks that Jippo was buying. <laughs> <laughs> Who is he? <laughs> he's Jippo Nolan. And he's stronger than any bull, eh, Jippo? Am I right? You're right. You see, you see why not an hour ago, with me own two eyes, I saw Jippo knock the scrap of Maloney flying across the road like a man diving off the boat wall. He's a king, that's what he is. King Jippo, am I right? Uh, Usn't he to be pals with Frankie McPhillip, who was shot by the black and tans tonight? Hey, when you mention the dead, you might say, the Lord have mercy on his soul. Oh, unity, boys, now unity. Did you hear what he said? I did. May the Lord have mercy on his soul. He died fighting for Ireland to be free. And every man here should do the same thing. And I'll do it when my time's called. And so will King Jeppo. So will King Jeppo. Am I right, Jeppo, my lord? Right, Terry. Silence, quiet! Silence there, everybody. Quiet, Jeppo. You I have the floor. I want everybody, I want everybody to come and have some chips. Some fish and chips with me. With King Jippo. Do you hear that? Do you hear that? Fish and chips with King Jippo. I stood outside the shop and watched them. Dozens of scuts and wrecks from the slums of Dublin some of them scrawling onto the counter, some of them dancing jigs, and all of them pushing the fish and chips into their hungry mouths. Jippo stood in the midst of them, proud as a cock he was, laughing and singing and eating and paying for it all with the money that he had on him. I kept a close watch on the amount he spent. It was half past ten when he and Terry, the fawning, treacherous, bright-eyed pup who was leading him around, came out of the fish and chips shop. Ah... Uh, Ah, it is a fine night. It's the finest night of me life. Jippo! Terry, give me that rock. <laughs> Wait a minute. Wait a minute. There's someone waiting for me. You know who I mean. Jippo, Jippo, me darling. Wait for me. Wait for me. And they walked away in the wet darkness, really. And I tracked after him. What are you stopping for, Jippo? Where are you taking to me? Where are you taking me, you little scut? 
Ain't you after taking me to Katie yet? Ah, there you go. There you go. Talking about Katie and we having a fine little jamboree. Now, don't worry about your little Judy. She'll be running after another man. Never fear. Don't you be talking about Katie. Hey, hey, what are you? What are you? A big ship, you drunk and bedazzled. That's what she asked. Here, take your hands off me. You think you're king, do you? Well, you're a big lump of beef. That's all you are, a big lump of beef. You're drunk and your last pen is spent. And I have no further use for you, Mr. Jip O'Nolan, ipso facto. Yeah, me, me, me last penny spent, is it, John? Uh, let me see now. Two, four, six, eight. <laughs> oh, by the holy, where did you get it, Jip? Well, there's enough there to choke a horse. <laughs> and me joking about it a few minutes ago. Ha, ah, Jip my boy, you're a king and a descendant of kings. And I'd fight for you and I'd die for you if the time comes. And there's me hand on it, Jip The hand of a man that's true and loyal. Am I right, Jippo? Come on, you little scut. I'm going to find Katie. Yes, and I'm the boy to lead you to her. Come on. She's a lovely girl, Jippo. A lovely girl. You should be proud of her. This is Herbert Marshall with Act Three of The Informer, starring Victor McLaglen as the tortured giant, Gippo Nolan. Rather than to the diggings of Katie Madden, it was to the Shebeen of Aunt Betty that Terry had taken Jip O'Nolan. As early as 11 o'clock, I stood near a chink of light from the bay window at the side of the house, and I watched Jip goaded by Terry, throwing his money away. Two hours of drunken carousing in a place that should have been too expensive for the likes of Jip By then, it was time for me to enter. Finally, me boy! Hey, Barney, come have a drink! Come along, Jippo. It's time to be going now. Ha <laughs> ha, be up with you. Who are you giving orders to? Yeah, bash him, Jippo, bash him. Who do they think he is giving orders to me and King Jippo? Shut up. They're not my orders, Jippo. They're Gallagher's. And you better be careful about disobeying us. You're right, Barty. Is it one o'clock? It is. Come on, Jippo, let's go. Katie, Katie, I've been looking all over for you. And where, where, where have you been? I was in my digs. I waited for you. Why didn't you come? Mulholland. Jippo, Jippo, what's wrong? Where's he taking you? Oh, Katie, it's all right, it's all right. Don't worry, no. Gather is taking me back. Oh. Hey, Bartley. Shut up, Jippo. Now, come along, come on. Will you stop it? Keep your hands off me, will you? Katie. Do you remember the 20 pounds I was talking about? 20 pounds? Yes, I got it. I got it for you, Katie. 20 pounds. 20 pounds. Come on, Jippo. I've heard enough of that talk. Oh, come on. Come on. This way. This way, Barty, me boy. 20 pounds. 20 pounds. Time. There wasn't much of it left. It was 1.30. Downstairs in the ammunition dump, three judges sat at a table. Little Mulligan the tailor sat on a bench, a coffin from time to time and saying his rosary. And Mary McPhillip, dressed in black mourning, sat in a chair next to the blind man. And Dan Gallagher, after announcing to the judges that his case was prepared, paced the floor. Surrounding all of them, 
were the men of Captain Condon's company standing at attention with their rifles in their hands. It was into this that I brought Chippo Nolan. Danny. Danny, me boy. I salute you. Sit down, Jippo. Mulligan. Mulligan. Now, what brings you here? Man alive, you ought to be in bed. This is no hour for a sick man to be out. Then Isn't I... Mulligan the man you told me about, Jippo? Huh? Oh. Oh, listen, man. I, I, I had a drop taken before he came in here, and I didn't know what I was saying. But now I remember. Mulligan. Him there. That's the one that informed on Frankie McPhillip. I saw him, and he knows it. It's a lie. It's a lie. I swear on my knees. I never left the house except to go to the chapel to say my prayers. Ah, ha, ha, ha. Me fine by you. It's easy. It's easy work for an informer to be swearing oaths. But it's a lie. It's a lie. Sit down, Jippo. <laughs> I salute you, Commandant. Peter Mulligan, do you recognize the authority of this court? I do, I do, Dan. Heaven knows I do. Will you stand over here, please? Give the court an account of your whereabouts from noon today. Well, at, at noon today, I was lying in my bed. I had a bad pain in my right side from bronchitis all morning, and I had to stay in my bed. Then, uh, at uh, one o'clock about, my old woman gave me a cup of tea and an egg. Never mind the egg. Tell us about yourself. There you are. There you are now. Hear what he says? Come on, Mulligan, now. Make a clean breast of it. Uh, it's not for me to condemn you, Jippo. Maybe you're not responsible. Why, blast you? What do you mean? What are you driving Sit at? down, Jippo, and keep quiet. Go on, Mulligan. Uh, well, I, I worked until about six o'clock. Then I ran down home and put on my overcoat. The same one it was. Uh, second-handed it is. And I went to the chapel. How long did you stay? Well, I, I stayed until about half past six. And then I stayed outside the door talking to Father Conroy for about... Uh, uh, about... Ten minutes. Did you talk to anyone else? I was coming to that, Dan. And then after I left Father Conroy, I met Barney Kerrigan. There he is, holding a gun among your men. Near the chapel? Yes. And you couldn't have been near the Black and Tans headquarters, say, about six o'clock? Heaven forbid. I hope that I right here if I was. You're lying. You're lying. Keep quiet. He's lying, Barney. He shut up, Jippo. Tell us what you did after you left Kerrigan. Well, I, I went back to the house and did a bit more until about eight o'clock. And then I felt the pains in my side again, and I went into my bed. Until three men under, under Mr. Tom Connor there come in and bundled me into a car without a buy your leave, as if I was a criminal. One more question, Mulligan. Did you bear anyone a grievance? About your sister Susie, I mean. My sister Susie, is it? Sure, my sister Susie's name is Mary Ellen. And for the past 28 years, she's been living in Boston, Massachusetts. She's the mother of eight children. That's enough. It is that. Did you bear any man a grudge? I bear no fellow man a grudge on me, oh. You had no grievance against Frankie McPhillip? The Lord have mercy on his soul, what for? I hope his sorrows are over for him. I swear on my immortal soul, Miss McPhillip, I bore no grudge against your brother. Badly. Badly. Get your, your hand, hand out of my pocket. That's right, Chippo. Mulligan, you'll be taken home in the car that brought you here. I'm sorry this had to happen. We'll see what can be done for you later. <laughs> I said you did. Good night, Mulligan. Show him out, Kerrigan. Now, Jippo, suppose you tell us what you did with your time from six o'clock this evening until Mulholland picked you up at one. What? Now, what's it to do with you where I was? Don't you feel like telling us what you did after meeting Frankie McPhillip at the Dunboy house at six o'clock or thereabouts? Uh, I, I'm all mixed up. I... I'm sorry. Mary, will you repeat what Frankie told you when he came home tonight? He said that he met him at the Dunboy house. He said he had to make sure that there was no guard on our home. Is that true, Jippo? I... If not, why did you shout out at the wake tonight that you had warned him to stay away from the house? Uh, that's it. That's it. That's what I did now. That's what I told him. You did see him then? What did you mean by telling all those lies about Mulligan? Were you drunk or what? Well, well, I, I had taken a little drop. I, and uh, maybe too. What did you do after leaving Frankie? Well... What did you do after leaving Frankie? Well, suppose I don't tell you. Well, what then? What would you do? Suit yourself. If you don't want to tell me, Bartley Mulholland there can do it for you. Uh, I'm all mixed up. I, I, I don't know what I'm doing. I, well, I, I don't know what I'm doing. Where did you get that money you spent? I, I can't make out nothing, Dan. 
I tell you, I, I'm drunk. I can't. You broke I... your first pound in Ryan's. The blind man there said you gave him a pound. He did. That he did, the poor man. A pound note he gave me. Two pounds you spent in the fish and chip shop. Another two pounds went for drink to the Shabin where Mulholland picked you up. Five pounds you gave to some woman. Four pounds you gave to another woman known as Aunt Betty. And finally, you gave five pounds to Katie Madden. That makes just 20 pounds. Ah, uh, oh, me head sore, Dan. I, I'm drunk. I tell you. Where did you get that 20 pounds? Tell I, us. I can't remember. I, I, I can't remember, Dan. I, I don't know nothing. Confess, man, and ease your soul. Who was the informer? I didn't know what I was doing, Dan. I didn't know what I was doing, Dan. I, I didn't know what I was doing, you see. Or what I mean, Bodley. Bodley, boys, isn't there a man here that can tell me why I did it? Oh, oh me head is sore. I can't tell him. I don't know why I did it. I don't know why I did it. Bartley, put that gun away. Lock him up. Come on, Jippo. I, I don't know why I did it. I don't know why I did it. It's all over now, Mary. Wait outside. I'll take you home in a minute. Bartley, I've got three straws in my hand. We'll draw to see who takes care of Jippo. While we were drawing straws to carry out the penalty of the court, Jippo Nolan sat in a cell. Drops of water were coming down from the ceiling. Jippo looked up. Only a wooden grating separated him from the street. He climbed up into a ledge and then, with only the strength that he had, he put his back to the grating and he began to strain. The grating was heavier than he counted on. But... Still he strained. It was the one chance he had for life, and he knew it. I watched Denny sweat as he took out his gun and opened the door to the cell. As he entered, the grating crashed to the floor, and he had his last look of Jippo slipping out through the opening. Dan! 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 He's gone! What's that? Come on, sir. Jippo Nolan's escaped. We've got to work fast, lads. If he reaches the tans before we get him, we're finished. The whole movement's finished, you understand? Now jump to it, and remember, we're done for it if he gets away. Out you go. Fogabella. Chippo. They're, they're after me, Katie. Oh, you put the heart crosswise in me. Where have you been? Uh, they're after me. Uh, they, they're not going to get me. Uh, we'll get away, you and me. Shh, shh, Chippo. Where, where, where's, the, where's the 20 pounds I gave you? 20 pounds? What are you talking about? What's wrong with you? I, I done it for you. That, 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 that's what I couldn't tell Gallagher. He wouldn't understand. You understand? You did what? What have you done? I informed on Frankie. Oh, Jippo. Oh. May God have mercy on your soul. Katie, we'll, we'll get away. They won't get me. That's how I love you, darling. I, I, I sold me old pal out for you. Oh, Jippo. <laughs> That's a lovely fire. A lovely fire. Lie and rest yourself. Oh, this is good. Good. You don't, you don't know what it is to be running around in a fog on a night like this, Katie. Katie, sit down beside me, darling. Here with me, head on your lap. Oh, darling. You're the only one I can trust now. Do you love me? Yes. Yes, I love you, Chippo. I love you when I'm playing. You don't know what you've done to me. I'd lay me life down for you. You poor blind boy. Commandant. Yes, Bartley. She wants to see you. It's Katie Madden. She insists on seeing you. Who? Who? Katie Madden. She won't talk to a soul of us. Send her in, Bartley. Yes, sir. Now, in here. I'm Jippo Nolan's girl. Shut the door. Commandant. Commandant, 
I've come to beg of you on my knees. He didn't know what he was doing. So you can't hurt him if you know how it was. No? You think the Tans will let him alone now? They'll drag everything he knows out of him. His own fear will drive him to them and make him a weapon to destroy us all. I'll take him away. Please, Katie. I swear. Please. By all that's holy, I will. Miss, 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 Miss Philip, you're the one that's been hurt. I, I'm not the kind of girl that you are. There was a time when I was. And I love Jippo no less for being what I am. I can see by your eyes that you love the commandant, too. Well, supposing it was his life that you were begging for, wouldn't you be wanting mercy then? And wouldn't you be giving it to me now, a sinner? Where is Jippo now? Oh, poor lad. He's in my room, the other side of the church. <laughs> I didn't wait to hear the rest of the conversation. I'd been listening on the other side of the door, and when Katie Madden said Jippo was in her room, that's where I took Tommy and Dennis. I myself covered the front of the house whilst they crept upstairs to the room to get him. Come on now, Dennis, as you do the short match. I'm not afraid, but the door is locked. Look, I, I can blow the lock off. Yes. Are you ready now? Yes, go on. But when I do, you open the door and in you go. Get it over. Mother, of course. Dennis, look out. He's waiting for you. Oh. All right, you boy. Do it. I... Oh. Uh, uh, not me, you don't. You blow me. Throat. Throat. Ah, <laughs> i got to take care of both of them. I've got to have a plan now. i got to get away. Downstairs, outside, and then to the mountain. I'll be safe there. Bartley! I was waiting for him. He looked like some wild animal, like a bull that had gone mad with the heat and the thirst. Quick as I could, I took out my gun. Oh. I stepped back into the shadows and watched. He turned left and he started down the street. How he could stand up after what I'd fired into him, only heaven knows. He walked slowly with his feet far apart and his knees never bending toward the church next door. And I still followed him, as I'd done all that evening. But somehow, he managed to climb the steps to the church and to get inside. As he started down the center aisle, the strength went out of him and he fell. Uh -huh, but he wasn't through yet. Frankie McPhillips' mother was in that church in the first pew. I watched Jippo pull himself up from the floor, slowly, painfully, his nails clawing at the edge of a pew, just as Frankie's nails had clawed at the windowsill when the tans shot him. His body was burning, but his face was sweet and smiling like a child's when he stopped and knelt before Mrs. McPhillips. It was I informed on your son, Mrs. McPhillips. Forgive me. Ah, oh, Jippo, I forgive you. You didn't know what you were doing, God help you. You didn't know what you were doing. He got to his feet then, and he managed to stagger a few more steps towards an image of our Lord. Then, raising his arms toward him, as he has always offered mercy and forgiveness, Jippo cried, Frankie! Frankie! Your mother forgives me. Oh, oh. Jippo Nolan fell to the floor. His time had run out. Now, here is our host, Mr. Herbert Marshall. And our star, Victor McLaglan. Tell me, Victor, 
How does it feel playing a role years after you first created it? Well, Bart, uh, you don't have to really create Jippo. He's there. You just have to find him again. You found him this evening, all right. Oh, it was a fine performance. Thank you, thank you. Uh, Jippo is like a favorite old suit of clothes to me. It feels good to get into them again, if you follow me. I do, yes. And there'll be a lot more following you in the next weeks of NBC's Radio Theater. What's planned for next week, Bart? Uh, next week, Florence Eldridge and Frederick March will star in There Shall Be No Night. Ah, that's certainly an impressive event. Tell me, how about your season, Victor? Any big plans afoot? Yes, some real big ones, Bart. I'm leaving for Mexico on a fishing trip. <laughs> well, that sounds very interesting. Best of luck to it. And thank you for joining us tonight, Victor. Good night. Good night. Remember next week, the Pulitzer Prize play by Robert Sherwood, There Shall Be No Night, starring Florence Eldridge and Frederick March. Until then, this is Herbert Marshall saying good night for your radio theater. The Informer was presented through the courtesy of RKO Radio Pictures Incorporated, producers of The Conqueror in Technicolor and Cinemascope, and starring John Wayne and Susan Hayward. This $6 million production will be released early in 1956. Our radio play was adapted by Howard Teichman. Our cast this evening included Ramsey Hill as Bartley, Tom McKee was Frankie, Betty Harford was Mary, Sean McClory was Tommy, Jonathan Hole was Mulligan, George Pembroke was McCarthy, Donald Lawton was the Major, Gil Fry the Officer, Charles Davis was Dan, Joe Cranston was Kerrigan, Alma Lawton was Katie, Norma Varden was the mother, Robert Shafto the bartender, Eric Snowden was Terry, and Stanley Fraser was Dennis. Your radio theater was directed by Andrew C. Love, Selwyn Tober, associate. This is Don Stanley speaking. Let's visit with lovable Tibber McGee and Molly tonight on the NBC Radio Network.